this Saturday at noon Eastern time on Fox. So we have Gus Johnson and Joel Klatt calling what I think should be a top 25 matchup as the 5-1 and one Nebraska Cornhuskers travel to Bloomington, Indiana to take on the 16th ranked undefeated at 6-0 and Indiana Hoosiers. I already made a preview and prediction video for this matchup. I would really love it if we could get 10,000 views on that preview and prediction video. It's over 4,000 right now, approaching 5,000. So if you haven't already watched that video, also just as a side note, there will be a spoiler alert for my score prediction so that I can give context for why I'm making this video in a few seconds. So with that being said, if you haven't watched it already, and just so you can get some background information for this video, click the link down below in the pinned comment and watch that, please, if you haven't already. But I picked Indiana to win this game 28-14 to for a variety of reasons that you can see in the video. Uh, don't tell me that I didn't warn you. But what we're talking about today is five reasons why Nebraska can win this game. That's what we're going to be discussing today. And please subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can get notified when my video talking about reasons why I'm picking Indiana to win the game specifically will drop tomorrow morning. You won't want to miss that either, and you're going to want to watch this whole video because, well, there are several reasons why Nebraska can win this game. I want to take a minute before we dive into those reasons, though, and talk about what this game means for Nebraska. Iowa versus Michigan State is a game that has a lot of meaning for both teams. It's the same thing for Illinois and Michigan. What I love about this weekend in the Big Ten, even though Oregon's just playing Purdue, which Purdue is a history of upsets, but Oregon's favored big and for a good reason, and Penn State and Ohio State are on a bye, is that we have so many games that mean a lot for a variety of teams. This game means a lot for both Nebraska and Indiana. And it means especially a lot to Nebraska. Indiana has already reached bowl eligibility. They've already overachieved. It means a lot for Indiana because if they win here, they're 7-0 and and their chances of going 10-2 and or 11-1 and get that much better, which is insane to say, but it's possible. But for Nebraska, a win here is their first win against a top 25 team since 2016, a team that at the time was ranked inside of the top 25. And it would be their first year of clinching bowl eligibility since 2016 of that same season. Nebraska has had a drought of success. They've had a lack of success for years. And a win here really casts all of that aside and shows the world that Nebraska is at least back to being competitive. And with how good Indiana is, they're at least, well, back to being competent if they win here, but then let's say finish seven and five or even six and six, which I'd say is unlikely. I think a win over Indiana here shows that Nebraska is a top 25 team. But before we dive into these five reasons why, Thank you for listening to that, and please subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, like the video, share, comment five reasons or just a reason why you think Nebraska can win this game, and join our Discord server via the link in the description or down below in the pinned comment where we talk college football 24-7, and check out the merchandise store and also my Patreon page if you want to support the channel monetarily. You can get some nice comfortable college football with Sam t-shirts or sweaters. You can get t-shirts and even your own Big Ten school colors if you want. And for the Patreon page, if you're an All-American or Heisman member, you do get access to my weekly picks for all Power 4 games. Nice little spreadsheet format for that that I publish on Friday. But without further ado, let's get to this. Um, reason number one is Nebraska has an elite defensive line. And they also have quality depth on the defensive line. Nebraska's D-line this season has 13 total sacks. They have a sack percentage of 10.4%, which means for every about 10% of their opponent's dropbacks, they earn a sack. Every time the opponent has 10 passing attempts, Nebraska earns a sack. 
That, that's, that's pretty good. Very impressive. They're up there right now nationally in sack percentage. And they only allow 73.2 rushing yards per game and 2.5 yards per carry. I can give you the specific numbers thanks to teamrankings.com where Nebraska places in these categories. They are second in rushing yards allowed per game, third in opponent yards per carry. They are eighth in opponent rushing first downs per game. And in passing the ball, uh, or defending the pass rather, they are fifth in sack percentage, again with that 10.4 sack percentage right there. They average 3.6 sacks per game, which is fourth. And we'll talk more about other parts of their defense later on in this video, but this is an elite defense. It is one of the best defenses in the country per ESPN's efficiency metrics, S&P Plus, by my own eye test, and when my potential power finally gets up and running, I wouldn't be shocked if Nebraska ranked very high defensively there, and, and overall as a team too. This D-line is the identity of the team. They are big, they are fast, they are tough, they want to be mean, they want to push you around, and Pay attention to several of their players, like Nash Huttmacher and Ty Robinson, and they have depth pieces, for example, like James Williams, who can step up in a big way. And also pay attention to Cameron Lenhart, to Jamari Butler, to Princewell Unman Malin. They have a really deep defensive line that is totally Big Ten ready, that can get after the quarterback, that can blow up explosive or potentially explosive running plays, and... They're going up against an Indiana offense that has not seen this type of defense, specifically this type of defensive line. They could wreak havoc on Indiana this Saturday. Reason number two is the fantastic cover corners that Nebraska has. I heard that Tommy Hill may be healthy for this game, and pairing him with C.R. Wright, who's performed at a high level at Nebraska filling in for Hill, and Marquise Buford Jr. would be killer for Nebraska in a positive way and killer for Indiana in in a negative way. Indiana, as I'll talk about tomorrow, has very successful and productive wide receivers. So with with multiple receivers to cover and with a quarterback who is as good as Curtis Rourke, you want fantastic cover corners, and Nebraska has that. These three players on the season have nine passes defended. They have three interceptions. And the secondary's only bad game was against Illinois. They blew up Colorado's passing offense. UTEP, Northern Iowa couldn't do anything through the air. Purdue couldn't do anything through the air. And Rutgers, I mean, my goodness, Rutgers got assassinated in, in Memorial Stadium. That was one of the more dominant seven-point wins I have ever seen, I have ever watched in my life. That was an absolute depanting on the national stage where Rutgers just got humiliated 14 to nothing for most of the game, mainly because not just of Nebraska's D-line, but Kaliak Manis was unable to throw the ball downfield with a receiver core that I thought was underrated entering the matchup. And Nebraska won, Rutgers got blown out by Wisconsin, but a win, a win honestly, when you're in Nebraska especially, is a win, and their defense has looked really good in all of their games outside of Northern Iowa and Illinois. But it looked elite against Colorado, it looked elite against Rutgers, and with the injuries that they've dealt with, specifically to Tommy Hill, only getting healthier means they're only going to get better. And it sounds like Tommy Hill could be back. So I think that's good news. I think even without him, Nebraska still has pretty good cover corners specifically, and their secondary overall is still impressive. They are 22nd in opponent yards per pass attempt allowed, only allowing 6.2 per pass attempt, and they're 23rd in yards per completion allowed, allowing 10.4. Opponents on average only throw for about 193.6 yards on Nebraska in a game, that's 31st, and opponents complete about 60% of their passes against Nebraska, which is 50. So Nebraska's secondary is not this, you know, number one secondary nationally, although I think they are much higher than their statistics suggest. Illinois has a ruthlessly efficient passing offense. Colorado has a high ceiling passing attack, and Nebraska totally shut it down. Typically, you can only see um, the forest and the trees, the big picture and small picture accurately when at least the regular season is done or 
the at the earliest by the time you get to November. I imagine Nebraska's passing offense throughout the season will either stay where it is now statistically or slightly improve based off of the opponents they're going to face and the fact that Tommy Hill is not out for the season and he is a big part of their secondary. Their explosive passing offense that Nebraska has is the third reason. And by explosive, I don't mean it's explosive all the time. I mean that it can be explosive. It has the capability to make big plays, to extend drives, to score jaw-dropping touchdowns. Nebraska on the year is 123 of 182 through the air for 1,468 passing yards, 8 yards per attempt flat, 9 touchdowns, 3 interceptions. They have 7 players with 100 or more receiving yards. Jamal Banks and Isaiah Nayer have been very impressive wide receivers. Nayer with 291 receiving yards and four receiving touchdowns. Jamal Banks with 283 receiving yards and two receiving touchdowns. Nebraska on the season is averaging 11.9 yards per completion. Uh, Jalen Lloyd is averaging 30 yards per completion. Nayer 17, Jamal Banks 13.5. A lot of action from Carter Nelson, uh, Janarian Bonner, Ramir Johnson and Thomas Fedoni, along with Emmett Johnson, are pushing some of those numbers down. But Nebraska's receivers, especially the starters, are typically used for explosive plays, and then you have some other players who are used as wrinkles or for the intermediate game, and that's the same case with running backs Ramir Johnson and Emmett Johnson and Thomas Fedoni II. These, these receivers and quarterback Dylan Riola, who's paired with them, they have good chemistry, they have a good understanding of each other, and Nebraska can work down the field with their passing offense. So I really like the group of receivers and tight ends that Nebraska has, and Dylan Riola, he did not have a good game against Rutgers. However, I imagine that over the bye, he is better rested, he's probably worked through some of those things, and I think that his performance against Rutgers is his bottom. Like, that is the worst that he will be all season, of course, when you factor an opponent. I don't know how Nebraska will do against Ohio State, for example, or how Dylan Riola will do against that Buckeye defense or Iowa's defense, who are some of the best in the country and best they'll face all season long. However, relative to competition, I think that's the worst you're going to see him all season long, and he has had some games where he just is tearing apart opposing defenses. So him and his receivers are a big part of the reason why Nebraska can win this game. They're averaging 7.6 yards per pass attempt right now, which is only 52nd, and 11.5 yards per completion when you take out the Northern Iowa game, which is 78th, but they have had some explosive plays mixed in there with a lot of the short passes that they do throw, and that explosivity, if they can get behind an Indiana secondary that right now is letting opponents complete 63.23% of their passes— and an Indiana defense that's only 30th in sack percentage, if the quarterback can be protected, the receivers can get open, and Riola can throw dimes and have a good day, they can get behind this Indiana defense. Up next, you have field generals at linebacker. Nebraska's defense is ranked first in S&P+. I was shocked to learn this, but also not totally shocked at the same time, not completely surprised, because... They've had one of the better performing defenses of the season, and that was the case last year, and they return most of their defense from the 2023 season. A huge part of that is due to their linebackers. The fact that they have field generals, they have playmakers, Mackay Gebeyer, John Bullock, and then you have others too, like Stefan Thompson, MJ Sherman, and Javin Wright. All these different players in the linebacker room, the edge position, they set the pace of the game. John Bullock has had a huge year with one interception, a forced fumble, three passes defended, and two sacks. I I really like this linebacker group, and I think that they can do a good job tackling, getting to the quarterback, playing in coverage. Indiana has a good set of tight ends. And they do have a efficient rushing offense. So these linebackers are going to have to step up if Nebraska wants to win. And they can. They are capable of stepping up, shutting down Indiana's rushing attack, and helping Nebraska to earn their first top 25 win 
in quite some time, in nearly a decade. And last but not least, we have some Swiss Army Knife players. That's what I'm going to call this reason. It's not the biggest reason, that's why it's reason number five, but Ramir Johnson, Jacory Barney Jr., and Heinrich Harburg are players that have a variety of different roles. I've seen Harburg line up as a receiver, and I have seen Jacory Barney Jr. run multiple end arounds, which is something he's good at. That's why he has two rushing touchdowns on seven carries for over 100 yards. Ramir Johnson is averaging 4.1 yards per carry on the ground, and he's averaging 9.1 yards per reception with a receiving touchdown. He is a receiving running back. It's what Mark Whipple wanted to use him as in 2022. Well, He's finally gotten around to being that, a, a running back who is also a threat in the receiver game. So pay attention, I'd say, to those three players, because I think Nebraska is going to have to pull out some stops. They're going to have to run some never-before-seen plays or rarely utilized plays, formations, and trickery to win here. Because Indiana is a good team. They are. They haven't played much of anyone, but granted... Nebraska hasn't necessarily either, and you look at the Hoosiers, their efficiency numbers are off the charts. Like, even with their weak strength of schedule, they are clearly a good team based off of their efficiency metrics and the fact that we have a six-game sample size of them playing at a high level. Nebraska will need these Swiss Army Knife players, these players that have multiple skill sets and uses, to come out and make some plays. I would especially expect this from Ramir Johnson and Ja'Cory Barney Jr. As for Heinrich Harburg, I don't know, but having a quarterback who can run, they'll sometimes put him on the field with Riola, like we're two quarterbacks on the field. That would be something that I think could throw Indiana's defense off. Thank you so much for watching this video. That's it for today. Remember to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and comment your thoughts down below. Thanks to Crash2488, Brasco Rascal, and Conalulu OH for sponsoring this video as Heisman members. Thanks to Chris Lane, Ismar Tyler9, Jilton Kush for being all American members. And thanks to John Lynn, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Austin Christmas, Joshua Jorgensen, and Will Loftus for being all conference members. Remember to check out my Patreon page, merchandise store, and Discord server via the link in the description or down below in the pinned comment. Have a great day, everyone, and go Big Red. GBR.